Hello everybody, my name is Chris and this is my channel Barnon11970. And hopefully this is going to be a very important video to help anybody out there to maybe start to see life in a different, more positive way. And I have a story that I want to show that can prove that even in your worst hours, even when everything is piling up on you and getting you down and depression sets in, that if you see it for what it could be, and sometimes you can't see that at the, at the present moment, but if you, what I like to call, understand of where you could lead from a bad situation, you may see it in a different light and it may help you. So this may be a, vi a long video, but please give it, give it a chance and watch the whole thing and let me know what you think afterwards. So I'm going to share with you probably my worst day ever in life or the worst time in my life because it's definitely more than one day and show you how good things eventually came from it so i'm about to share a very personal story with you and the reason i was pretty much inspired by this today is you know sometimes when you go through youtube you're going to get recommendations and a lot of times um, you'll get stuff that has nothing to do with what you're looking at and some things will catch your attention and I saw some people doing some reviews about the new Winnie the Pooh movie with the Christopher Robin. And that kind of reminded me of a very bad time in my life. So I want to explain. This is going back to the late 90s, I would say roughly around 1998 when I first bought this house. And at the time I was single. And... I went out with a friend of mine who's no longer with us. Unfortunately, he's deceased at this point, passed away earlier this year. Was my best friend since ninth grade. But at the time, we used to hang out, go and club and go to bars, try and, you know, meet women and, you know, try and have a good time as friends. And we went to a couple of clubs. I don't remember where they were, but we ended up at the end of the night, we went to a White Castle. Because at the time I was eating all that red meat and stuff, but that was, you know, for a younger time. And there was a girl working behind the counter, and I just had interest in her. And somehow I had this feeling that this person was going to be an important person in my life. And the funny part is, I got my food, sat down, and I just saw her from afar. And every now and then I would see her head pop up looking over at me. So I didn't have the courage back then, because back then I was a very insecure person. I wasn't really into major amounts of relationships at that point. I wasn't, you know, I didn't have the wisdom I have now. So I didn't have the confidence. So I actually, when I left, as I was leaving, I said, I can't leave without asking this girl out. But I didn't have the nerve to do it. So I actually convinced my best friend to go in there and speak to this woman for me. Ends up that she was interested gave me her number, thought it was actually kind of cute that I had to send my friend in to ask her out on a date. We went out and things clicked very quickly. Her name, uh, and I'm not going to give full names, but her name was Faith, which I always found ironic. So we dated for a little while and we ended up hitting it off and getting very serious. And at one point probably about a month into the relationship, because things kind of went quickly as far as dating was, she informs me, well, we were watching, and I remember it, because it was in the middle of watching Titanic. And at the time, I had a v VCR and a VHS, so there were two parts to the Titanic video. And during the intermission, she's like, I got to talk to you. I'm like, all right, guys always love to hear that from a girl, especially if they're dating them. She says she's pregnant. Now, at the time, I thought that was a little interesting because we had only been dating for about a month, maybe less. And she already informs me that she was pregnant. Now, a little backstory. Before I met her, like I said, I was a very insecure person. I was very, af not afraid of women, but definitely intimidated by women. I didn't really know how to act. I was one of those guys that, you know, would bring the flowers and call all the time and see how you're doing. And that tended to scare a lot of women off because even though back in the days we were always told, you know, you'd be a gentleman 
and you hear things like from people talking about Oprah back in the days that, you know, the women supposedly like the nicer guys and it ends up they just want them as friends. So this was the first relationship that a girl was really interested in me. So she tells me she's pregnant. And I was actually excited at the time because I haven't, I didn't have that experience at that time. Now in 1998, I was 27 years old. So it's not like I was 14. But before I met this person, like I said, I was very intimidated by women and I was just a totally different person. Did not have the confidence. So we dated for a little while and all of a sudden she got distant when I said, you know, a couple of weeks later, she ends up calling me one day and she says, Chris, I'm getting an abortion. Take care. Click. Couldn't reach her. She moved from where she was living at the time and um, disappeared from my life. And I'm thinking, okay, I was going to be a father. I was getting ready to be a father. I was excited about being a father. And then for some reason, she calls me out of the blue and says, basically, it's over. I'm getting an abortion and just hangs up on me. It was literally like that. So that put me in a very depressed spiral at that point because I was kind of sensing some distance before that phone call. So, you know, you kind of get that feeling. So eventually I start move, trying to move on with my life and I start dating other girls. And I start dating this one girl, and I don't remember her name. And things were going pretty good until one day, about eight months later, I get a phone call out of the blue. Now, probably about seven months have gone by since that phone call. I get another phone call. She's like, hey, it's Faith. And it took me a second to remember. And then, But then I knew. I'm like, what's up? This is, you know, first time I'm hearing you from you in a long time. How are you? And she's like, you're a father. I'm like, what? She's like, you're a father. So I'm like, I'll call you right back. I call the girl that I was just starting to date. Now, we weren't boyfriend and girlfriend at this point. We had only dated a couple of times, but she was somebody I was interested in. And I call her up and say, listen, I just got a phone call from a girl saying, I'm the father of her child. I got to go. And she respected it and appreciated the fact that I was honest. And because we weren't dating for a long time, you know, she wasn't heartbroken. But I ended that relationship. Got in my car. She ended up, I called her back first, actually. Found out she lived about maybe about a half hour from where I was living at the time. She was living with, I guess, her brother or father, or some family member, and I go to visit her. So I drop everything for this girl. Now, as you could see, I'm a white male. She was a white female, you know, half Puerto Rican, or some form of Latin, but she was probably paler than I was. I used to joke about her, about that all the time. And when I saw the baby... The baby was African-American. Now, the first instinct when I saw this baby is, I said to myself, I said, this baby's not mine. There's no way. Doesn't look like me at all. Doesn't look like her. And last time I checked, I don't have any uh, black family members in my family. I'm Irish, English, and Italian. But she tried to convince me at the time, like I said, I was very insecure. I wasn't very confident at that time. She swears up and down that the baby's 100% mine. And that when she was a baby, she started out very dark. And she even showed me pictures, which uh, she was definitely not as pale as she is to this day. Well, I mean, I haven't talked to her in years. So she ends up convincing me that the baby's mine. And that she wants to get back together with me. She's sorry for what she did. And we end up starting to date. At the time, I thought she was my soulmate. I mean, from the day I met her, I had that feeling. And as I grew to 
learned from this person of who she really was. She was a very controlling person. She had me wrapped around her finger. She knew how to push the buttons. So we periodically, would the relationship was going okay, but she was definitely, it seemed like she was using this child for almost an agenda. And I fell in love with this baby. Beautiful baby. I mean, this this baby, I wouldn't have been surprised if she ended up being in you know commercials and ended up being some kind of model or something at some point. It was a beautiful baby. And I always said that, you know, the first time I change a diaper it will be my child. So it was the first and only time I actually changed a diaper on a baby. And I grew very attached to this baby. But I questioned it. And um, periodically, she was, a, she was like a gang member, I found out, early in her life. She used to talk about how she was in a certain gang. I won't mention which one, but she used to talk about... And it's funny because she was probably four foot six to four foot eight barely 95 pounds soaking wet but she was a tough girl but she used to talk about how she used to have like switch blades on or razor blades under her tongue just in case she got into fights and stuff just definitely not the type of girl i was used to dating but she definitely when she wanted to get her way she would start fights so she can have an excuse to leave the house and just go and not tell me where she was and of course, with the insecurity that I had, I would sit at home and just wait for her to come home and forgive her, and she'd ask for forgiveness, and everything would be fine, but she'd utilize that. And right where you see that TV was where we set up a little baby's room, a cradle and everything. And I always said if I was going to have a child, if I had a boy, I wanted to name it Christopher Robin. Now, the baby was a girl, so obviously... Uh, and the baby was already named, so I didn't have a say in that. But I tried to get her into Winnie the Pooh, because I used to love the song, you know, from um, the guy who sings Footloose, Kenny Loggins, who has the song um, about Winnie the Pooh. And because my name is Christopher, it always hit me. I always loved Christopher Robin. I always loved the story of Winnie the Pooh. So on the wall back there, below the crib, well, above the crib was a poster of Winnie the Pooh and Christopher Robin. One day, after she leaves about the fourth or fifth time, I was getting some laundry that she did for me. She used to love doing that. And out comes this note that falls to the ground. So it wasn't labeled or anything. So I ended up thinking maybe she left me a note, so I read it. And it ended up it was a love letter from one of her ex-boyfriends, who she was seeing behind my back. So when she got home, I confronted her about it. And of course, she didn't deny it, but she didn't contest to it either. She just started an argument saying, how could you betray me by that, like doing that? Like accusing me of sneaking around when I just saw a letter that fell to the ground in my laundry. I assumed it was a note from her and read it, only to find out she was cheating on me. And then she put me down a lot, made me feel horrible. To the point where I was convinced, okay, I guess you're right. Let it slide. But now I had it in my mind, the doubt. And again, periodically, if she wanted to go, and I ended up finding out later on that she would purposely start fights so she had an excuse to storm out of the house, go visit her ex, who was probably about five minutes away from where we were living, do whatever they were doing, and then come back because of the fact that uh, I provided money and the other guy didn't. And especially taking care of her baby. She kind of liked that. So after a while, I started getting a little annoyed by what she was doing. Because, I mean, you can only do so much. Even if you love somebody, you know, even if you're insecure, you can only take so much before you start questioning and reevaluating. And I started getting to that point. And periodically she would break up with me and then disappear for a couple of months and then she'd come back and I'd be stupid enough to take her back. It was the insecurity. We all have that in our life at one point or another. So the last time she calls me, and she would always use the baby as a way to kind of set in. 
And at this point, I was just so done with it at this point. I loved her to death. I thought she was my soulmate. But enough was enough at this point. I was tired of being used. She used to call me her Mr. Rogers. Because she, I was like one of the first white guys she ever dated. And wasn't used to me being so nice and so kind and so considerate. Almost like she didn't respect me because I was such an easy pushover at the time. But the last time she called me back, I was basically, I had enough at that point. And I said, listen, if you need a place to stay, I will help you. But as far as a relationship, it's not going to happen. If you are really telling me honestly that you're worried about your child, you know, I have a connection with this baby. I will be there for you, but we're not sleeping in the same bedroom. I will sleep on the couch. And she's like, fine. And I guess at that point, it kind of, you know, sometimes you don't want you want what you can't have. And she basically started seducing me. So it ends up that she said she wanted to marry me. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. You're going to come up with some excuse. So we were sitting outside one day and she just does her usual thing. We'd sit out in the front porch and she'd smoke her cigarette and we'd talk. And we had, when she was good, it was great. We had great conversations. We got along, we clicked. But when she wanted her way, she got it. And I let her for the insecurity. But at that point, I was kind of like, you know, I'm. she started seeing a little change. And I guess maybe because I wasn't giving her everything she wanted and when, I, when she snapped her finger, I guess maybe she gained a little respect for me. She said she wanted to spend the rest of her life with me, and she made up her mind. I didn't believe her. I was like, you know, whatever. And that's basically what I said. And she's like, well, I got to find some way to prove it to you. I'm like, don't worry about it. I, you know, I believe you. So she says, what if my, you know, what if I get a tattoo of your name on my body? Would you believe me then? I'm like, well, if somebody wants to do that, yeah, but I, I, there's no way you're going to do it. As a matter of fact, we'll do this. Your birthday's coming up. I think it was maybe a month or two from that point. I said, your birthday's coming up. What if we go for your birthday and I'll buy you a tattoo, thinking she's going to come up with some last-minute excuse? She's like, well, what if we go tomorrow? I'm like, I got the money. If you want to go tomorrow, I'll drive you to a tattoo place, thinking she's either going to leave or make up some excuse. Next morning comes. I'm waiting for her to come up with some excuse. She's like, are we going to get the tattoo? So I'm like, yeah, no problem. So I'm thinking, you know, she's just going to go that far. We'll go to the tattoo place. She won't find anything. She'll make up some excuse. Long story short, she ends up getting the tattoo. Now... Like I said earlier, she was a gang member at one point. I didn't know this at the time, or I didn't know the extent of it. But she was always talking about how she was, like, you know, a tough girl. And she was, for especially for her size. She got a tattoo with my name on her lower back in all solid black ink. And the whole time, she was crying from the pain. And I thought to myself, she's got to be serious at this point. Because she wrote my name, and it wasn't my idea, it was her idea. It's not like I tried to do something to control her. I wasn't that type of person. As much as I loved somebody, as much as I cared, as much as I was a pushover, if somebody wanted to leave, I wasn't a chaser. That's the one thing. I was never one of those stalker chasers. My thing is, I don't care how much I love you, if you want to go, don't let the door hit you on the rear end on the way out, whether I wanted it or not. So I'm like, this girl just got a tattoo of my name on her back. It's a permanent tattoo in the darkest black ink you can imagine. And she was in pain the whole time it was happening. So I'm like, I guess she must be serious. And I, in the parking lot, asked her to marry me. And she said yes. Fast forward to one week later. Comes to my house, says we got to talk. Okay, all right, here we go. She sits me in the backyard of my house and says, I saw my ex, told him how I was getting married, ready to move on, all excited, and he cried. And she said, 
this was a like a gangster kind of guy was in a gang never seen him cry before she takes off the ring says I gotta go as much as I didn't want it it didn't really shock me that that happened but the one thing I always said is I at least respected her for the fact that at least she told me to my face because a lot of girls I dated before that you know they'd just stop calling because I was the nice guy now you think that's bad enough so first of all I have a girl that leaves me in the beginning saying that she's going to have an abortion even though she said I was the father of the child which she was pregnant for 100% was mine in her mind then I find out when I started moving on that she calls me out of the blue and all says by the way you're a father drop the relationship I'm in drop everything to go see her to only to find out that even though I'm white and even though she's Puerto Rican or Latina um, she was as pale as I am baby was black I mean dark black get together leave several times get into a fight she'd leave whenever she wants and I found out later on it's because she would go visit this ex then she basically tries to prove herself by getting a tattoo of my name on her body we get engaged and a week later she says she's gotta go so you think that's bad enough well and I didn't find this out until years later in 2001 after working a double shift at my house well not at my house but I was DJing for somebody and I was doing my massage business and at the time I was working for somebody else I wasn't working for myself so I worked like a 16 hour day to come home to find out that my house was robbed ended up she admitted years later that she sent her father who was basically a known criminal just got out of prison they brought a van to the front of my house in broad daylight and brought everything out the front door both my neighbors were home both saw it happen thought I was moving and robbed me blind not only robbed me blind but destroyed the house that day I left my wallet so not only did she steal all my major possessions like like I said I've said before I have a comic book channel and I've told people over the years some of my biggest key issue high-grade comics were stolen and it was from this event all my equipment and everything they couldn't steal they destroyed took my wallet which had all my credit cards in it which I found out years later because I thought I canceled it that she what she would do is she used made another credit card in my name in her name that I didn't know about and would bill everything but because she knew where I lived and she knew where I worked she would come to my house every day and take the mail so I never learned until years later that she put me in hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt to which I'm still paying for to this day now the reason I bring all this up is not to depress anybody or anybody to feel sorry for me because I want you to see that everybody can hit rock bottom now with all that stuff you'd think I would have turned into an alcoholic or wanted to commit suicide or all these different things and I had the depression I had the suicidal thoughts thought my life was over I had to get a second mortgage at one point this the year my house got robbed was on Cinco de Mayo of 2001 I just got into my own massage business the month before and we all know what happened on September 11 2001 so I almost went bankrupt spending what little money I had left to start my own business because I had just put all thousands of dollars of this in about a month before my house got robbed so all these things happened credit card was taken all this stuff 9-11 happens almost lost my life my livelihood but 
because of all that tragedy, instead of me turning to drugs and alcohol, instead of killing myself, because obviously I'm here, instead of saying, you know what, the heck with women, I'm going to treat them the way they treated me, I started working out. I started going to the gym. I started thinking about how I felt and how I was treated because she took advantage of me. She took me for granted because years later when she admitted, I mean, way after the fact that I can do anything about it, when she admitted that she had her father rob my house, she asked for forgiveness. And at that point I was way past it and I let it go and I haven't heard from her since. I mean, that was probably in 2005, 2006, but that was the last girl that ever had me wrapped around her finger. I started working out. I started building my confidence. I started, instead of being bitter, I said, you know what? This is how somebody made me feel. I've experienced the lowest of the low, the betrayal, the pain. And I don't ever want anyone else to ever feel the way I felt because then if I did that to somebody else, then I'm no better than her. And I will be darned if I ever let her win in that sense of totally defeating me. So I gained the confidence. And I learned not to be a bully, not to be abusive, not to be some lying manipulative person, but to stand up to somebody who is not treating me right, to walk away from dishonesty, to better myself. And instead of woe is me feeling sorry, two years later, when I got an insurance check for all the things that got stolen, now I got nowhere near back what I lost. I got a check for around $20,000. That wouldn't have even covered the comics. But with that lump sum, I ended up buying my own karaoke business and went into business for myself and ended up gaining a very good career to this day. But I built my confidence. I used that tragedy that I went through, not as a woe is me, not as a feel sorry for me, not as an excuse to say I'm justified for being angry, bitter, depressed. I said, what can I do to never put myself in that position again? Now, as you could see on this finger, that is a wedding ring. It took me until I was the age of 40 before I found the right woman. And she loves my confidence. I never force her to ever do anything. We have an understanding. We do get along. We can act like children. She respects me, loves me, and as far as I know, she wants to spend the rest of her life with me, and she's proven time and time again. Um, it, very shortly, we're about to hit our seventh anniversary. And she has been there for me through thick and thin, where times where I was expecting her to leave because I was just so used to women when times got rough, especially financially, women in my life would just get up and leave without question, without sympathy. There were times I thought maybe she would, and she stood by me. The point I'm trying to make with all this is this world especially in the past couple of years, is all about getting people angry, all about people fighting amongst each other, people being told that it's always somebody else's fault for your problems, that you never address the things that you need to heal. And one of the um, analogies I always used is, if you think of life this way, think of life like, let's say you're in ninth grade, and they have you do homework that you refuse to do. They have you do tests that you refuse to study. And ultimately, you fail ninth grade. Well, you either quit, and just there is your academic career, or you have to repeat that grade over again, which means all the things you should have learned and you could have learned, you have to learn over again. 
And if the second time you, you are defiant and say, well, you know what? You can't force me to learn. I'm not going to study. I'm not going to do my homework. And you fail again. Again, you have the option of quitting or doing it over and over again. So you will have to repeat the same things over and over again, even though it's irritating and frustrating and annoying and depressing. And people have in their life this repeated circular pattern of not the same person necessarily, but the same type of people or the same relationships or the same issues and problems and concerns keep coming up. It's because we haven't learned the purpose behind them. Now, the situation that I talked about, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. Got like one little thing sticking out there. I wouldn't wish what I had to go through on my worst enemy. But I wouldn't change it either. And here's why. That horrible, unfair situation that I had to deal with was the reason for who I became and who I am. So if that situation, if I had a crystal ball or if I had a magic genie that said, I can take away the worst part of your life and it'd be like that, it never happened. That could prevent me from being on the path of me meeting the person that is the best thing that ever happened to me. So the past is in the past. You don't see tears in my eyes. You don't see me angry. You don't hear me enraged when I told that story. I almost spoke about it like I was telling somebody else's life. Because the past is in the past. You'll never forget it. But until you deal with it and process it and move over it, you're going to feel it like a magnet pulling you back again. And like failing in school, you're doomed to repeat the same things over and over again until you learn the lesson. Because once you pass that ninth grade, you move on to the next level. You don't have to learn the same things you learned in ninth grade. You've already learned them and you passed. So the point through all of this is, is, is if there is something negative in your life, a bad situation, because trust me, I've almost died going on now six times in my life throughout my history because of breathing problems, walking pneumonia. Pretty serious. Bad relationships in the beginning. But those things built my character, made me caring, because you'll never really learn to care until the things you care for disappear. You don't learn things until you experience them. Just like you'd never appreciate a warm summer day if you didn't go through some cold blizzard. You won't experience and appreciate happiness until you know what it's like to be sad and depressed and have your soul ripped from your heart. It makes you appreciate the better things if you could see it from a positive point of view. So my story that happened in my life that I'm sharing with you is not meant for you to feel sorry for me. It's not meant for you to think, well, my situation isn't as bad as yours or vice versa. It's to say, here's a bad situation in my life that I'm willing to share and put out there on the internet that I'm not afraid of because it's an experience that I've learned in life. But it created my path to where I am now. Now, some people would say, oh, look at that cheap you know, wood paneling in the background and whatever. And look at me. I'm no GQ model. So am I really successful because I don't have millions of dollars in my pocket? I met a person that stands by me at my best and my worst who has stuck by me longer than anybody in my life other than my mother who allows me to be me without apology, finds my confidence sexy, 
to me, that's a measure of success. I don't need the millions of dollars. Would it be nice? Of course. Too many people say success is based on how many pieces of paper you have in your wallet, pocketbook, or bank account. And those people aren't really happy. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, my life is full of roses. There's always challenges. I have always been and always will be an overly emotional person. I've learned to deal with it in better ways from learning through my own personal experiences. But I'm one of those guys that if it's a depressing movie, I'll shed a tear. I'm not ashamed of it because the good thing about having feelings is you're a person that has the ability to feel. And a lot of times, caring people are that way because of so many tragic events in our lives. It made us care. Because I would never want to be one of those people that finds joy of punishing others and hurting others for their own personal satisfaction. And there are plenty of people that will do that. I experience it all the time, especially on YouTube even on my comic book channel, that because I might think differently or act differently or speak differently or believe in different ways, that that gives other people the right to try and hurt somebody, even if it's just as a mental level of saying, not physically hurting somebody, but mentally ganging up on somebody. I would never want to be that type of person. I can just imagine what kind of life they have had to lead to get to the point where instead of being helpful and kind and caring and considerate and compassionate, they decide to be cruel, mean, and unjust. What kind of life brought them to that point? Now, they may be very wealthy. They may have lots of friends. They may be patting themselves on the back saying, you know, they're the greatest person since sliced bread. But how you treat others really talks about the depth of your soul. And you never know where you're going to go until you're there. So what I mean by that is don't judge your life on a tragedy that may be happening now or happened in your past. Because that may have been the push that you needed to go in a direction and a path that could take you to something absolutely wonderful. And the joy of not knowing is what makes life the way it is. Because if you knew every step of the way where you're going to go, what excitement would there be? What good is a surprise party if you know it's a surprise party? Will you be surprised if they say, tomorrow we're taking you and you're going to walk into a house and all your family's going to jump out and say surprise? Are you going to be surprised if you know? But we've been trained in this world to be afraid of the unknown instead of excited about the unknown. Because most people see the world as the glass is half empty. Most people are afraid of the unknown because it's not there instead of saying, I can't wait to find out what's my next journey, where this path leads. Because here's the wonderful thing about a path. You can always get off it. You can always turn around and take another way. But the world teaches you that it's not your fault, it's not your responsibility, have others take care of you, and you'll be fine. Well, if the world was a great place and everybody was getting along, then I would say that's something to follow. But if you see most of the world is angry and depressed and poor and fighting amongst themselves, then obviously the people that are supposedly in charge of all these things must have an, an alternative motive. By their actions you shall know them, not by their words. And one of my cats wants attention. So this is Orgon. When I'm on camera, he likes to come and um, get a little attention. So what I'm trying to say is you never know where you're going to end up until you're there. So instead of being afraid of it because it's unknown or it's different, be excited that it could take you somewhere wonderful. Because not all fear is bad. How many people have been on a roller coaster? 
isn't a roller coaster ride a little scary? But yet, it's not scary in the sense of being bad. Because most people that are on a roller coaster smile and laugh, and they're full of excitement. The anticipation. The joy in life is what you need to see. And that doesn't mean that even if this video helps you think in a little different way or inspires you or what have you, it doesn't mean all of a sudden life is going to be wonderful. You're going to have your hard times. You're going to have people that are mean and cruel and rotten. There's going to be people going to hate you just because you're you. Maybe because they're jealous that you can think in a way that they couldn't dream of or they don't have the strength. But here's the thing. Everybody has the strength. It's all about are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to take however, lo however long it takes to get to your destination? Are you willing to put in the effort, the sacrifice, to sometimes take a step back to make two steps forward, even if those two steps take you 30 years? You are only limited by you regardless of what anybody else does or says. Because that girl, Faith, and that ironically was her name, was the worst experience in my life at the time. But ultimately created and pushed me in a direction of where I was. She wasn't the only reason. There was others, and I can do other stories if people are interested in the future. But it shaped me. Now, I didn't think about that, that back then. And it wouldn't have mattered if somebody said it to me because you don't want to hear it at the time. If you're going through pain right now, or you're shedding a tear from hearing all this stuff because you feel it too, or you've been there, or you're in it right now, it's going to hurt, and you may not listen to it right now. You may hear it, but you won't really listen. The beautiful thing about a video is you could watch it days, weeks, months, years later, provided YouTube doesn't block it. So my 42,000 subscribers... Only about 400 will get to see this. But if one person benefits from it, that's all I care about. Everything happens when you're ready for it. And if you're not ready for it, it's not going to happen. Like I tell people about soulmates. If you believe in soulmates, that means in a world of billions upon billions of people, there is one person out there for you. Would you want to meet that person when you're eight years old and then go your separate ways and never see them again? Wouldn't that be a waste? So why would you want something earlier than what it's ready for? It's like cooking eggs. Do you want to put them in the frying pan for one second and then just take them out and eat them because you didn't want to wait the full two or three minutes it took to cook them? Because you might get sick. You might not like them the very least, everything happens at the right moment. But because that moment is not here yet, we get insecure because that's why most people are in groups because groups of similar similar ideas or similar likes or what have you, it's the group energy that makes you feel strong. But it's the individual who can stand by themselves of the true strength because instead of other people dictating your path, you're choosing your own. So most people who are really caring, most people who are really strong, and I'm talking mentally, I'm not talking about physical strength because anybody can do that. It's a lot harder to be mentally strong. But those people tend to be solitary creatures. They tend to be alone. They tend to like to be alone, even though they say all the time, I want to be with somebody. Well, instead of saying, I want to be with somebody, how about saying, I want to be with somebody who can accept me for who I am? Because I don't want to be with just anybody. Because I'm sure we've all done that, where we had somebody come in just to fill a void and find out that it was nothing more than a black hole that could not be filled with that person, or that beverage, or that drug, or that addiction. So... Everybody has some kind of tragedy in their life. Just because it may not be as dramatic as mine doesn't mean yours isn't the worst thing that ever happened to you. Or you could be a person that 
says, oh, I can top your story 50-fold. That doesn't mean mine didn't have the impact it did in my life. Each person's going to be different. It's what you do with it and who you become from that tragic event will really put you on the path of where you ha you're headed. And it doesn't matter what you say because look at governments. They tell you everything that you want to hear. Look at corporations. They tell you everything that you want to hear to buy their products. Look at the news media. They tell you everything that you want to hear to make yourself feel good about yourself. Going to psychologists and things. Tell you everything that you want to hear. Nobody knows you better than you. But you got to listen. you got to pay attention. And you have to be honest with yourself. Because if you can't be honest with yourself, you're sure as heck not going to be honest with everybody else in your world. There's a reason why we have pain in this world. There's a reason why people are negative. There's a reason why we're hurt. It's because it's a learning tool. And if you can see it for that, seeing pain as a learning tool to progress and improve then was it really bad? If you can become a better person and it took you 15 years from that painful experience to get over it and be able to move on and say, you know what, today's the day I make change. You don't like the way you look physically? Well, start eating better. Start working out. Start getting up earlier in the morning. You don't like your job? Don't say you're stuck. Find a way to get yourself a new career. Even if it's something people don't like, because I make Oregon pyramids. There are plenty of people out there that don't understand them. There are a few people that make fun of me for them. I don't put a gun to anybody's head. I have plenty of people that see my videos and contact me because they have a similar idea. They resonate with the things that I create. Just because somebody else doesn't understand it does not... I mean, they have the right to attack it and make fun of me. But it's what I do that matters. I don't let it bother me anymore. It used to because I tried so hard to try and make all those people like me. Now I don't care. I only want my wife to like me. And maybe my subscribers that are here for the right reasons to like what I represent. My family. Those are the important ones. Not some stranger that I'll never meet on the internet who needs to be anonymous and find joy in trying to hurt somebody. But again, I had to go through all that to where I shut down my first channel here and I shut down my first We Love Comics channel because of the bullying and the attacks and the ganging up and the lies and all this other stuff. And I let it get to me. And that's why I learned if you argue with a fool, the one thing you will realize is that there are two, pe two foolish people in the conversation. So if there's somebody holding you back, it's not them. It's you because it's your choice to stay in a bad situation because maybe it's convenient or you don't believe in yourself. That may be true, but that doesn't mean you can't change. So that's the story. I hope you listened to the end. And if you listened to this entire video tell me how many fingers I'm holding up and place that in the comment section let me know what you thought about this I want to hear from you watch this video anytime you need it because that's the beautiful thing about the internet subscribe to the channel if you haven't please hit the like button and definitely hit the share button because I'm sure YouTube will automatically flag this as inappropriate which I will find funny when they do it because they tar once they target a channel, you're doomed. Uh, if anybody ever wants to join my Patreon, there's information in the description. It's not mandatory at all, but if you want to, it definitely helps. I didn't say any of this stuff for sympathy or anything like that. Please don't ever take it for that reason. I'm sure one or two will, but again, I don't care about those people. And look at your life, and instead of seeing the future as something scary... See it as something exciting, where you can go next, because this is your journey. This is your ride. Make it fun. Make it into something. 
What's in the past is gone, but don't try and spend your whole life forgetting it because you cannot forget traumatic events because they're there to set into your brain so you never forget it. But forgive, let go, learn from it so you can reminisce about it like the story I told tonight about my situation with a girl and not feel the pain anymore, not feel the anger or the resentment. I don't feel any of that anymore because my heart is in the right place with the right woman and the right life, even though it can improve, and it will. Like I said, everything happens at the right moment. Otherwise, it's a waste of time because you want to make sure you meet your soulmate when everything is aligned when those two magnets can attract instead of repel. So you don't want to meet your soulmate six years, six months, or six seconds too early. Because if you're not ready for it, then it passes you by and it's just two ships in the night. And if you believe in reincarnation, maybe that's why we keep coming back over and over again. One, to learn more and more, but two... Maybe it takes several thousand lifetimes for us to finally accept that there is a soulmate out there and now's the time we could finally get with them. Who knows? Each person's experience is supposed to be that, their own experience. This world is trying to group everybody into group thoughts. So your experience is now based upon what other people say is okay. That's the wrong way to go. So... The world isn't going to be solved with this video. Your world isn't going to be solved with this video. But if it pushes you or helps guide you, which is probably the better word, in a better direction, and you say, today's the day I'm going to stop feeling sorry for myself, I'm not going to turn to alcohol anymore or drugs anymore, I'm not going to abuse my spouse, I'm not going to do all these negative things, and I'm finally going to take responsibility and start doing more positive things, then this happened at the right time. And I promise you, give it a week or two, watch in the comment section, you will see at least one, if not more, comments saying, this happened just at the right time I needed it. I hear that a lot. And if you think that's a coincidence, then you're, you're not understanding how wonderful life can be. Because like I've said in the past, life is made of light and magnetism. And your magnetism comes from not here in your head, but here in your heart. And that's why you could lie to yourself and you could lie to the world and you could be pretty darn good at it. But if you do not feel in your heart what you're saying from your head, you will attract the very opposite of what you portray. So you'll see plenty of people, they talk out of their rear axle and you know they're full of you know what. But yet, they keep having all these bad things happen to them. It's because their heart is projecting the true magnetism that pulls towards them. Because it's not what you think or what you believe. It's what you feel that attracts things to you. So if something is happening in your life, you've attracted it to you. Whether you like it or not. Because if it's a bad thing, that means you're trying to learn something. And what better way to make you learn something than have it to be so nasty, so horrible, so wrong, that even though you may hate it and every, it may be painful and depressing and sad and unfortunate, you'll never forget it. So like they say, be careful what you wish for, you might get it. So sometimes you learn the best parts of your life through a painful experience. So is it any wonder that things are coming to you that you're attracting to yourself? that are not what you want. And because you say, woe is me, or you say, I'm not going to pay attention, I'm just going to ignore it, because the world says, you know, just ignore it, it's going to keep coming back. And it's going to keep getting worse. And it's going to be the exact opposite of what you want. Until you finally say, today's the day I'm going to face it. I'm going to learn from it. Because once you learn from it, it disappears on its own. So the very thing that you didn't want will go away when you learn what the message that you drew in from yourself to get that thing or situation to you had to say. You just have to figure that out. And if you didn't figure it out before and this video helps you to figure it out, 
Do you think you accidentally found this video? Or do you think you were drawn here because your heart, which works at the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles per second, will instantly gravitate you to something that just others will feel coincidentally happened. And I actually feel sorry for people that think life is full of random moments of chance and coincidence. It's a heck of a way to live. That's basically saying life has no purpose, life has no meaning, you're nothing more than a, a leaf in the wind hoping that the wind blows you in the right direction. You are all-powerful. And you will learn most of the things you learn. You will become a caring person, not because everybody was good to you in your life. Most of the time, it's because life handed you those lemons. And you didn't like how that felt. And you won't forget how that felt. And maybe you decided, I don't want to be like that person or those people. So was it really bad? So I want to thank you all for listening to this. It, it is something that I feel comfortable with sharing. And um, I wish you all nothing but the best. So thanks for listening. Have a great night. And I'll see you next video. Peace out.